I've covered plenty of Zelda speedruns on the channel, but did you notice one game I never covered? Twilight Princess HD on the Wii U. Now believe it or not, this speedrun is actually super unique that has tons of glitches and routes that's not seen in the GameCube version. So today, I'm going to do a full breakdown of the entire run. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy and please don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more awesome content. All right, so the run has just started. This is a Twilight Princess HD speed run. And if you watch my previous videos about Twilight Princess, this one is gonna be really exciting. Now this game is fundamentally the same for a casual, but in a speed run perspective, it's actually an incredibly unique and interesting speed run. And you're gonna see the first kind of skip and major difference with the route immediately as we start. So if you watch the GameCube version, you might know that you kind of get a rock up against this fence and you clip partially inside of it and you clip through. Well, none of that works on the HD version. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get a Pona over to this gate and then perfectly align a Pona so that if you bonk into that little fence, a Pona will basically push you through the gate and you will just kind of pop through. Getting through this gate early is not as powerful as the GameCube version since you can't do certain glitches that's possible in the GameCube version. But that being said, there are still a lot of things that we can do. So we're gonna go through this kind of open area here, enter this cave so we can get the small key, and then we're gonna run up and use it onto this gate. However, once we get into this part, however, this is where we start to run into a bit of an issue. There are some enemies here, but you can see we don't have a weapon. We don't, we have a lantern, that's it, that's all we have. We don't have a sword, we don't have Wolf Link. So why are we here in the first place? Well, this is where the interesting route changes starts to take place. So the first thing right here, there's two ways to basically activate this event. First, we need this cage to break. Then we need to actually be able to kill the enemies. Break into cage is the easy part because we can use the two enemies to break the cage for us. But now, how do we deal with the enemies? Well, I introduce to you enemy pushing. <laughs> so the enemies are only supposed to be over there in that kind of like backer I was just at. However, you can theoretically push them very carefully and their AI will kind of just not really know how to react or attack you properly when you're pushing them, which is very good because we want to push them all the way over here because this bird right here has very specific properties because Nintendo made sure that this bird can attack the player in case you try and steal items from him because you can actually be a thief. But that also extends to enemies and that lets you do both of the objectives to progress in the game. So after pushing the second enemy, he's just gonna die by the bird and we're now able to basically progress past the first kind of, you know, story element without having, having gotten any of the equipments. And after freeing the monkey and the kid, we're just gonna go through some kind of mandatory story stuff. So do the goat section, then head over to this area so you get put into the castle, run through the castle, do a couple of cool tricks to speed up the movement, but nothing too fancy overall. Then get put back into the forest as Wolf Link. Then you're gonna sneak around and pick up both the sword and the shield because unlike the GameCube version, we're not gonna be able to do a glitch that they do called Sword and Shield Skip. After you do that, we're going to be heading over to unfortunately doing one of the tier collecting quests. Thankfully though, um, when it comes to the GameCube versus HD version, I usually say just play whatever version you own because there's very minor differences between GameCube and HD. But the one difference that the HD version actually made that is an improvement over GameCube is that they shortened the tier collecting sequence. So you have to pick up less tiers. So thankfully, each one of these parts does not feel as long and dreadful as the uh, GameCube version did. But before we get further into this video, a quick word from today's sponsor. You guys know I love Manscaped, but have you heard about the new product launch recently? Introducing the Handyman. Not only does product come in a super sleek and compact design, which looks absolutely amazing in my opinion, but also it's amazing for shaving. It comes with a unique dual blade system, which helps you get a perfect shave that doesn't give you kind of a patchy beard, just a clean one. And if you're worried about nicks or cuts at all, it has this skin safe technology, so the shave is always up to date. And best of all, if you go to manscaped.com slash link is seven or click the promo code in the description of this video, you will get 20% off your first order plus free shipping. So what are you waiting for? Do it, click the link. Thank you so much Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Now, once we're through here, we're going to start praying to RNGs for the first time in this run. Where this monkey, you might have 
Actually, I think most people don't like him in a casual playthrough, but especially speedrunners don't like him. Because not only is he incredibly slow and takes a very slow path, but also you can see that he stops right here and kind of does this to move the smoke away. Well, how many times he does that is actually luck based. So you can get really lucky and have a quite have a quick path where he doesn't stop much, or you can have him stopping constantly. Thankfully, there's a few things you can do to sort of speed up this section. First, you can cut some of the grass to get some rupees. But you can also see here that we kind of try and like push him forward here a little bit as he's doing that. And it's just to make him cover just a tiny bit more ground so that it's more likely that we're going to have less stops. And then finally, once you're done with all of it, you can enter the dungeon. Now, this is also another part where this is very, very different compared to the GameCube version. So on the GameCube version, you basically completely skip this dungeon. But due to some reasons I'm going to get into later, we actually have to complete it. But that does not mean that this is going to be casual in any sense of the imagination. So we're going to go through the first room, pick up some rupees and also free the first monkey. Now, if you've ever played this dungeon, you will know that you're supposed to collect like, what is it, five or six monkeys, basically, to be able to progress through it. But thanks to still some glitches, we can still minimize how much you have to do. So we're going to go into the main room, and then we're going to head to the side room on the left to collect the second monkey. And once you have these two monkeys, you can build like this slightly longer bridge to head to the right side of the dungeon. We are basically going to perform a big skip. So we're going to go to this sort of outside area that normally would be the kind of way that you leave the mini boss room. And there's these bridges that you have to use the Gale Boomerang to flip so that they kind of match up. But what you can do instead is this very cool glitch. So what we're going to do is we're going to take up Midna, which for some reason makes the game force the bridges to turn around. And then we're going to walk off of the ledge right as the bridge turns to clip into the fence. Then we're going to use Midna again to flip the bridge a second time. So now we're standing inside of the railing and the open bridge is ahead of us. Then we can use that to just kind of jump across to get access uh, to this little platform. Now we're basically going to do the same thing a second time with these last three bridges. And once we've gotten past these three bridges, we can now enter the mini boss room from basically backwards. And once we've done that, we can super quickly just kind of take down the mini boss and just skip a huge portion of the dungeon. And now we officially have the Gale Boomerang, which if you don't know is the absolute most broken item in this game by far. Basically, there is something, a mechanic that is not a glitch heavy. It's actually in quote unquote intended called a long jump attack. What that means is that anytime you target an enemy that is far away from you, this can be with Wolf Link without glitches, they can be if they're close to you, you name it, right? Anytime you target an enemy that's further away from you, Link will do a jump slash that is further than if the enemy was close to you. But this can be abused because the limit for how far and how much speed you can actually have is incredibly high. And it just so happens that if you target something with the Gale Boomerang and it is on a surface that is either higher than Link is currently at or above a void, it will always treat it as max speed. You're actually gonna see your first example right now where we are. So right there you saw a short one, but this is when you can see how broken it becomes. So normally here, you're supposed to get all of the monkeys to build this bridge. But what we're gonna do instead is we're going to aim, go up here, we're going to aim to the right, and we're going to aim on this tree. And because this is over in a void, when you jump slash, you just go super far. Then we can climb over here, throw the Gale Boomerang, it's at a spot higher than us, jump slash again, and you just fly across that gap. And by doing that, we just skipped all of the monkeys, just instantly. It is incredibly broken of a mechanic, and it can be used for skips, it can be used for fast movement, you name it. It's incredibly cool. And right here, you would probably feel like this is one of the slowest and most tedious bosses in the game, which it normally is a casual list. Well, speedrunners do it a little bit differently. You can probably tell that we got two of the bombs over to us and then hit him immediately with the third one so that they're not progressing in their explosion in the cutscene. And then we can use the bombs right here in this very specific way. Look at this. So you kind of delay the bombs by continuously keeping them in the Gale Boomerang, hit the, bo the boss one time with the bomb, and then continuously throw this in the Gale Boomerang to continuously delay the second bomb from exploding. 
So you can just one cycle it, just like that. Uh, after that, we are kind of just ready to leave the forest. There's nothing keeping us here anymore. Uh, we've completed everything, but that does not mean that we're going to be following the intended path uh, of what the game expects from us. But there's one quick little detour that we're going to do before leaving, and that is to this guy to buy a bottle. More importantly, it's a bottle filled with an object that we can consume. Believe it or not, it's one of the most important items in the game. You would probably imagine that a bottle with some oil is very useless, but it's literally one of the most important items for this run to work. And what we're going to be doing now once we're at Hyrule Field is we're going to head over to the portal to go into the Twilight Realm towards Kakarika Village, take down the Shadow Beast quickly, and then sort of get this cutscene with warping the bridge. Now, in a normal playthrough, you have to fill up this bridge. Now, in the GameCube version, or if you watch my most recent YouTube video, you will know about basically a forest escape glitch that lets you completely skip this entire event. Now, on the HD version, you actually have to warp this bridge, which is, by the way, the reasoning for why we had to complete the forest temple, because you're not able to warp the bridge over if you did not complete the dungeon. However, we're not going to warp this bridge just yet. Because why we're going up here is actually so that we can turn into Wolf Link in the overworld. And this is where the routes starts to change a lot compared to a normal playthrough would be. So what we're going to do is we're going to head off back into Hyrule Field, but now as Wolf Link, and we're going to head over to the left here where this kind of gate is. And we're going to go up to this little gate area here. And that's because you can actually clip through this gate by knocking into it and why it's swinging, you can do a really precise side hop that kind of just clips you straight through the gate. And once you've done that, you can now actually get access to Zora's domain in like the kind of Zora area earlier. And once we're here, we're gonna run up to the shopkeeper, talk to him quickly to progress the event, go to the shadow beast that just spawned, kill him so that the weird flying monster, whatever you wanna call him, can pick Wolf up. And then we're going to do this cool out of bounds so we can take kind of a more straight path. And this saves about six seconds. Uh, but once you've done that, it's still just kind of flying through the cave. Then you run through all of the ice, uh, go up to the top, defeat the shadow beast for the warp point. We're going to warp over to the forest. We're going to get the bridge. We're going to warp it to the gorge and then finally enter Kakariko, getting back on track after our little detour going to Zora's Domain. Now, here, once we're into the village, you would imagine that this is another kind of slumber party where it's just kind of, you know, boring shadow beast tear collecting. And you would be right for the most part. But there's one really cool trick in this village that is very unique compared to the other tear collecting quests. So, the first tiers are just like you would imagine in a normal cash playthrough until we want to get up to the top of the village. Here, what normally would happen is you would run forward, you would get a cutscene where a bug runs into a house, you'd end up to follow them into the house, the house is basically going to be burnt down, then you have to go outside, watch a long cutscene of it burning down, and just kind of go through a lot of cutscenes and hoops, but there's actually a way to skip this. So what we're going to do is once we get to the top of this roof, we're going to very carefully get on top of this railing right here. Then we're going to line ourselves up perfectly and do another side op to land on the metal railing. Now here, it might not look precise, but trust me, this is incredibly precise. So we're going to get a perfect position, do a perfect lineup on those textures here. And if you do all of that, you can just barely jump over to that edge. Now you might be wondering, why would we want to do that? Well, that's because if you kill the bug before it enters the house, the game is going to assume that you've already burned down the house because the only way that that bug would be killed is if you burned down the house. So you can just immediately pick up all four bug tiers and then immediately just leave. It's really, really cool, but it is very difficult. After that though, it's the same as every other place. Go through, kill the bugs, pick up the last two tiers, and then finally we're done with the tier collecting. We've now done two out of three. Now here is where one of the major sequence breaks comes up in the game. We're going to jump on top of a Pona and then ride into Hyrule Field. Now here is something really cool. So we're kind of restricted in where we can go in the overworld right now. We're kind of stuck onto this portion. We can't really go back. But what we're going to do is do you remember that bottle we purchased earlier for 100 rupees with oil and where I mentioned that it's actually one of the most important items for breaking this game? Well, you're going to see it right now. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take a pwn out. We're going to ride up into this corner right here, right above this void. And then as we are about to walk off of the void, we start consuming and refilling our lantern with the bottle of oil. Now, if you are in this animation as you're falling, you will get past the void out trigger that would normally be there that goes, hey, make sure to void him out and respawn him back on Hyrule Field. That lets you now ride a Pona out of bounds below the game surface. And then you can see you just get teleported up here to this random cutscene. Well, that's because most cutscenes in this game extend basically close to an infinite distance or a very high distance up and down uh, into the air. So what that means is that by riding a Pona underneath this kind of Twilight Portal, it will just pick you up and immediately take you into the Twilight Realm. Why is this important, you might ask? Well, because now in the Twilight Realm, we can teleport. Meaning that we can teleport up to the top of Goron to activate the event of the meteorite falling from the volcano, which then lets us warp the meteorite over to Zora, meaning we just skipped the second dungeon in the game. The game only checks when it comes to completing the first portion of the game if you got the third and final mask piece. Meaning that the only purpose normally to beat the second dungeon is to have access to Zora. But by combining those two glitches together, the gate clip I mentioned earlier, and that opponent dive with the bottle, we completely skipped the entire purpose of the second dungeon, so now we're basically in. And now we're basically gonna go ahead and just pick up the tiers super quickly. There's really nothing special about it. And once we're done with that and we've turned back into Link instead of Wolf Link, we want to go ahead and actually get the Zora tunic because unlike the GameCube version where that's not mandatory for the speedrun, it is for this version. But we start to come into a couple of issues. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna head all the way over to Hyrule Castle, pretty normal stuff, to activate the wagon quest which progresses us towards getting the Zora tunic. But this is where the problems really start to arise. Because normally, you would have a lot of items when you're at this point in the game. But we have none of those, because we skipped it all with the glitches. Meaning, we cannot actually defeat the boss in this area. And I guess also a good thing to mention is even if we could, we wouldn't want to fight him because he's just a very slow boss fight. But thankfully, this is where more glitches starts to come into play. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna position Epona just perfectly into this corner, run into Epona, and then just void out. Yeah, so basically what happens here is super cool. So you probably noticed that I just skipped the bridge if you're paying attention. So basically, normally in the game, you cannot void out until you've gotten past that fight. Meaning that when we void out, the game just goes, oh, he must be past it. So it spawns us behind the bridge, past the fight, and more importantly, it actually spawns us with the small key. Meaning that we can just go and open up the gate without ever having to fight him. And on top of that as well, the kind of glitches and skips related to this wagon escort quest is not over. Because we can also skip the last part of the quest by basically going up as human and then using a long jump attack to jump over the trigger that checks if you follow the wagon all the way through. Meaning that even if it's on fire and far away, once you enter the loading zone, it just comes along with you and you completely skip it. And then after that, we can finally get a reward by following this kind of, you know, Zora goddess, whatever you want to call her. You follow her up onto this trail, and then finally she gives you the Zora tunic, which will be used for being able to complete the third, and I guess for us, second dungeon, but the third dungeon in the game, the Zora dungeon. Um, we're going to do a quick little detour on the way there to pick up the iron boots, but otherwise, it's just a lot of running around, heading back into the Zora area. Now, once we have the Iron Boots and we made our way back to Lake Hyrule, there's going to be some really cool movement to get back down. So first, we're going to do an Epona slide right here to get off Epona, which is you just slide down all of those stairs just absolutely beautifully. Then, to get down even faster, you're going to go up to this edge and then do a kind of like a jump slash or like a slash with your sword to partially clip out a bounce, which lets you fall through the floor down into this kind of like canyon area where the main like pool of water is, skipping having to slowly go down. Now, we actually can't enter this dungeon properly because we do not have uh, water bombs, which is required to kind of break the entrance. Thankfully, uh, just like the GameCube version, 
these pillars down here are what I like to say a little bit janky. Meaning that you can see if you swim up and you can even try this as a casual, it kind of just pushes you around. But if you are perfectly aligned, then once you swim up here, you'll just bam, pop out of bounds. And then you can just swim straight into the loading zone, skipping the water bombs altogether. And now we're just in the dungeon. Now for the actual lake bed temple, there is some really cool strats and skips that we can actually do thanks to having the Gale Boomerang. So we're going to continuously use the Gale Boomerang and target areas that are above us. So we can continuously do these long jump attacks to kind of skip the majority of the room. So right there, we just skipped a bunch of puzzles. Uh, in this main room right here, he's going to do a little bit of a lineup where he's going to go into this corner. You're going to target this edge and then target right above this place. Then you can do two long jump attacks, one to land on top of the railing and one and then one to land right here by the switch. And then we're going to take out our Gale Boomerang and warp over here. Now this makes no sense if you know the layout of this dungeon because here is the exit of the mini boss, which... If you enter from there, you can't fight the mini boss from. Well, by getting on top of this open chest right here, you can just barely make it on top the uh, stone railing. And by doing that, you can jump into the water completely out of order because normally you could only get up here later. But we still have an issue, which is that we don't have bombs to break this rock. But by picking up this pod, which for some reason doesn't break when it lands in the water, even though it falls, it just barely squeezes you in between the railing and the rock, which lets us swim through the tiny gap and then enter the mini boss fight early. And by entering this, it now activates the actual mini boss trigger, so you can activate the mini boss. And from there, we can just quickly fight him, then um, pick up the claw shot. And once you have the claw shot, you are ready to kind of just leave and proceed with the dungeon. Now, once we get back into the main room of this dungeon, we're going to do one of the weirdest things in this game. One of the bigger skips in this game that looks like nothing. If you watch a speedrunner do this, it would look like they kind of just brain farted and went to the wrong place. We're going to go into this corridor. We're going to open this door. We're going to watch this. And then we're just going to leave. Take note of this. I'm going to explain to you later. And when I mean later, I'm just going to give you a small spoiler. This glitch affects something in like an hour and a half later into the run. That's how weird this glitch is. Either way, that being said, we're going to uh, jump into this railing with this very precise clip uh, to clip inside of it. And then by perfectly walking uh, inside of this railing with some backflips, you can go out of the railing, kind of get pushed into the ceiling, and then you just jump down this hole. And now we basically just skip the boss key altogether and basically the whole dungeon. So the whole dungeon is super straightforward. And this boss is very difficult on the GameCube version because you don't have the Zora tunic. But on the HD version, it's very straightforward. The only really thing that's important to mention in this fight is that speedrunners do try and speed this boss fight up by basically hitting him four times and then equipping something over the iron boots and then insta hookshotting again, which kind of lets you hookshot him over and over and over again to be able to take him down without like getting knocked off of him. Um, however, it is RNG based based upon how he swims. So if he kind of swims in certain directions, you can't get a straight line of sight to re-hookshot him. But you can see right there, he got knocked off, immediately hookshot him back again, and then you just did the final blow. So it is a pretty fast fight. Uh, and then once you now get the third and final piece for the mask and you enter the overworld, we are going to get into both one of the most sad, but also most perfect sections of this run. Midna's Desperate Hour, which is a sad point in the game, but man, is this song so good. Go away, Bacoblin. We want to hear the song. Now, once you're done with Minas This Word Despair, it's basically just going to be going to get the Mass Sword as quickly as possible. So get to the forest, go through the Skull Kid area, take him down, do this beautiful puzzle that I know that everybody loves, and then finally go up to take up the Mass Sword. Now, at this point in the game, what we're supposed to do as the player is to go through some quests, be able to get a letter of kind of recommendation, and then head over to Arbiter's Ground. But it is much faster to go to Snow Peak out of order. Now, the GameCube version solves the issue of going to Snow Peak early by doing a glitch known as Map Glitch. 
basically it deactivates void out triggers in certain loading zones, meaning you can run through the snowstorm without voiding out and being told, hey, you can't go through here. For a long time, the HD version just could not do it. It was impossible because they patched a uh, map glitch. But a new method was found to get around this issue. So if Link just goes up a tiny bit higher onto this mountain here, he will hit that trigger that will void him out and respawn him back where we just entered. But what we will do instead is we will do this super precise setup right here where we perfectly position Link where it will force a spawn from this ice wolf at the super specific spot. Then what we're going to do at a very precise time, going to hook shot the wolf to interrupt him from going into it, entering a uh, wolf link, and then you're gonna pause buffer a specific movement here. What that will do is it will make him go so far to the left onto the hill to where if you release your B input, you will basically perform a long jump attack. And by doing that, you get past the trigger that normally voids you out and you can just get to the top of the mountain immediately. Now, once we're done with the snowboarding and we finally made it up to uh, Snow Peak, you might be wondering why we are going here right now. The game actually does not require you to complete this dungeon. Uh, because when it comes to the mirror shards, just like the mask shards, the game only looks for the last shard, which would be the one from City in Disguise. That being said, we still do have to get the ball and chain. So we're immediately, when we enter this area, going to go to the left. We're going to do a long jump attack to get across that gap. We're going to claw shot up into the second ceiling. We're going to jump down here. And this is so that we can attempt to enter the courtyard early. So we're going to go in between this kind of rock and ice, turn around to get pushed into the ice, and then backflip, which is going to be used to push through the ice in the opposite way without the cannon to get up to this door. Then we're going to go out to the actual courtyard here. And now once we're in the courtyard, we want to enter the mini bosses, which here we can do another skip. So we're going to turn this kind of ice monster, whatever his actual official name is, uh, around. And then if you do a jump with Wolf Link at a specific spot, he will push you through the door, which will clip you behind the door. But you can still open the door from behind him. Uh, and then you can just enter this mini boss from this direction and then just get behind him and then just do a bunch of spin attacks to immediately take him down and destroy his armor. And once that's done, we're literally done with this entire place. We are going to go and pick up the ball and chain. After the ball and chain, we will just enter this one next room to pick up some extra rupees. Uh, and these are going to be picked up slowly throughout the game just so that we can afford the 300 ruby cannon later on. Uh, and then we're just going to basically warp away uh, go over to Lake Hylia, uh, get the letter from this guy so that we're able to access the cannon. And then we can finally access the cannon, which will give us access to Arborist Ground. And now we get into the kind of like the village before Arborist Ground, where normally you would have to fight through a bunch of enemies and then fight a mini boss. But here comes a really cool trick. And this is actually quite difficult because they will, if you're not fast, completely destroy this. But what you can do is you can go up here, get on top of this tent right here, we're going to do a really precise jump on top of this wall, turn into Link, do a long jump attack on top of this wall, and you can see how close it is to working. Jump slash on top of this pillar, and then get around here on top of the ceiling, and thankfully, the cutscene trigger for activating the mini boss extends through the ceiling, so it just teleports you down into the fight. Uh, and then you also have to be very careful because this guy deals so much damage that he can actually one hit you and just instantly kill you. And then once you take him down, if you're able to, I should say, he will just activate the cutscene at the end of this area and then um, head into Arborist Ground. This dungeon is pretty straightforward compared to some of the other dungeons. This is sort of like a tower of the gods of Twilight Princess, if you know Wind Waker well. So there is these four posts that spread out and you have to collect at least Po 2, 3, and 4 because that's the actual flag that the game checks for to be able to open up the door. So we can skip the first one, uh, but otherwise it's mostly just going around and picking up the posts. We are are able to speed this process up however by doing them out of order so you can see right here that we go to the side we kind of get pushed up onto this pillar and able to jump up on this ledge 
So by doing some cool movement and maneuvering, we can go to like the fourth pole first, and then after that, we can kind of backtrack to make the progression throughout these rooms just a little bit faster. But it's mostly just going around collecting posters not much to explain once you've collected po two three and four the door will open though and you can move on to like the next part of the dungeon so first we can skip all the maneuvering around this area by very carefully doing a jump to clip into this kind of pillar to get past it and then you can actually just climb up this ledge which normally you're supposed to only be able to access from the other way uh once you have the spinner which lets you pick up the big key or the boss key basically immediately. Uh, once you have gotten that, we are going to head to the mini boss, but instead of going the normal path, we're basically going to backtrack, which makes it way faster. Now, the mini boss is actually a really cool uh, dungeon boss, and you can actually do a lot of different things when it comes to strategies for fighting him. Thankfully, there is a very precise skip to be able to skip him. So what you want to do is you want to interact with him so that he ends up trying to go into the corner right in front of the gate that normally opens up once you have defeated him. Then what you're going to do is you're going to hit him to stun him and then as he goes up into the air, you release your target attack, which does an incredibly high long jump, reaches all the way over the gate, lands on top of the stone, and then you can just jump down and pick up the spinner during the boss fight. Now, we are technically stuck in this little mini room where you get the item, but being able to just save and quit here just completely skips them all together, so you don't have to worry about it. And right now, we're actually just ready to beat the, the dungeon because we have the spinner, which can activate the end of the area, and we got the boss key out of order, so there's nothing stopping us. Now for the boss fight, um, there isn't really anything to explain. The first phase is basically as a casual playthrough experience, like you would imagine, just done quickly. For the second phase, there is one really cool strat that you can do. By doing perfect rolls here and delaying jumping on top of the Beyblade, which lets you actually jump off of the spinner and hit him without him going up the tower. And once you do that, you can get him down in one cycle if you do perfect spin attacks because of how much damage the Massacre does. Now, in the normal progression of the game, this is where we would start getting most of our mirror pieces. So this is the first one on top of Arbiter's Ground that we just got access to in the mirror itself. Then, obviously, we're supposed to go to Snow Peak for one piece. We're supposed to go to Temple of Time for another piece. And then the last one is in City in the Skies. But like I mentioned earlier, this game assumes you can't skip all of the dungeons. So it only checks for the last mirror piece to know that you actually got all of them. So here's where one of the major sequence breaks comes into the game that honestly saves about an hour or so. We're going to enter this house and then go underneath it where normally you would find the sky cannon. Now normally you can't access this until you have the wand to move the statue. But by having a very precise angle and then turning into Wolf Link at a very specific spot, you can clip into the statue, which lets you run past it. And then you can just warp the cannon away. So we're going to warp the cannon away to Lake Hylia. And once you've warped it over to Lake Hylia, we're just going to run up to the sky, pay 300 rupees for him to repair the cannon, get this beautiful little cutscene, and then that's done. That skips two dungeons right there. It's so simple. If you try this for probably 30 minutes, you could probably do this in your casual playthrough. Now, once we are in City in the Skies, we're going to be using a lot of glitches. If you thought that the, uh, that the Gale Boomerang was a broken item, you have not seen the true power of it until you watched this dungeon. Now, for this dungeon, for the first room, you can skip all of the puzzles on the side by just doing two quick long jump attacks to get across those falling blocks. And then here actually comes a major glitch. And you can probably see, it looks kind of strange. Why does he angle Link up right there, turn into Wolf Link, and then press A to open the door? Well, that's because you see up there that little fan that we should showcase on the screen. That normally is supposed to spin and does not stop until you get the boss key. And that's the way to stop you from getting the boss key early and is usually a shortcut to leave once you have the boss key 
way later in the dungeon. But the way the game determines to start that fan is done extremely lazily. They just put a tiny little like trigger in front of that door where if you walk on it, the game goes, oh, he walked over this trigger. We're going to activate the fan. What that means is that if you stand further away from the door as Wolf Link and then press A to open the door, you technically never walked over that trigger, meaning that the fan never starts. Uh, then we're going to get the small key and here comes another skip. So here, there's a dragon that's supposed to come and break this bridge from you uh, that basically changes the dynamic of this entire dungeon. You probably know how the dragon mechanic works if you've beaten Twilight Princess. But what we're going to do instead is we're going to go to the right side of this railing. We're going to jump up here. And then by doing a very precise uh, jump slash, you can go above the trigger that activates the cutscene of the dragon breaking the bridge. And from here on out, he will never break the bridge. It is entirely skipped. Now, once we enter the right side of this dungeon, this is where one of the strangest glitches in this game come in. Do you remember how way earlier in this video, I mentioned we're going to watch this and then we're just going to leave. Take note of this. I'm going to explain to you later. Well, here is where that sequence breaks gets used. What we're going to do is we're going to enter the right side of this dungeon. We're going to enter this door. We're going to quickly get through this room by walking past these falling blocks. And then here, you're going to notice something important. You're going to see that this gate right here is open. And you might know this is supposed to be a shortcut to leave this section once you've gotten the double claw shot. You're supposed to have to activate to open this gate. Why is that? Well, there's a few gates that can be opened or closed in dungeons, and all of these share the same flag in the game. And for some reason, only one can be opened or closed at the same time, and this trigger does not get reset. So by entering that door in Lake Bed Temple, the game goes, oh, there's a gate in this room, make sure that it's closed. But what that does is it sets it so every other gate that share that same flag are open. It makes absolutely no sense where the game is assigned that way. It's really dumb. In a casual playthrough, you would never know this because you would have to open the gate to progress to the dungeon. But since with glitches, you never had to actually open the gate. Thanks to that, we can just do a long jump attack through this room and we're now just in the room with the double claw shot. And this trick we did right here is also only done on the HD version. For some reason, it functions differently on the GameCube version. So you don't even see the GameCube version doing that skip. So if you're wondering what's the cool HD exclusive stuff, that's one of the only things in the game. Once we're past all of that weird shenanigans, we're going to enter this boss fight and you can also actually skip this mini boss fight. So the actual target for uh, for using your claw shot is actually always there. It's just sort of kind of like blocked by the gate. But if you set it up perfectly and you have a really precise aim, you can just barely claw shot it, which lets you completely skip the mini boss. So you can just get the double claw shot and then just head out of the room immediately. And once we have that now, we're actually kind of set up for the dungeon itself. So now, right? We got the double claw shot. We're done with the right side of the dungeon. And if we save warp after the double claw shot, we spawn back on the left side because the dragon never broke the bridge, meaning that we're almost immediately back to the middle of the dungeon. And since we never activated the fan in the main room, once we get back into the main room, we can just hook shot our way up to the very, very top of the dungeon and then just head over to where the boss key is and pick it up immediately, skipping all of the additional rooms and climbing around those annoying flying targets, I'm sure you all remember, to be able to have access to it. And once we have that, it is now time to show the true power of long jump attacks with the Gale Boomerang. This is one of my favorite parts of the run. So check this out. So what we're going to do instead of activating these things to spin to be able to properly claw shot around, we're going to get on top of this spinning, rotating platform. Then we're going to claw shot again to get on top of the second one. And then look at this. We're going to activate the Gale Boomerang right there. 
and then right there. Do one long jump attack, a second long jump attack, and make it all the way to the end. Just bam. Two quick jump slashes and it skips the whole sequence of activating the fans. Now, unfortunately, while most of the other bosses in this game have some really cool fighting mechanics and is really cool in the speedrun, this fight sucks. This fight is literally a straight up auto scroller. It is a really cool fight for a casual, and I'm sure in the comment section, you know, a lot of people saying, this fight doesn't suck, it's awesome, it was one of my favorites. I don't blame you, but once you've done this fight 50, 100, 200 times as a speedrunner, trust me, auto scrollers starts to suck. <laughs> and once you have that, uh, we are now actually ready to kind of head to the end of the game. Now for the sand fight, this is the only reason we spent so many minutes going out of our way to get the ball and chain. This hit right here is the only reason you need the ball and chain. That's it. 10 minutes of the run is spent to get that ball and chain for these two hits. Nothing else deals damage to his feet. I don't know what kind of shoes this man is wearing, but I want some of them because trust me, I stub my toes in everything and it is a problem. And I wish I wore those kind of shoes where only a gigantic ball and chain could hurt my toes. After that, we get into the last phase absolute banger music really cool manipulation able to get him quickly uh you can preemptively basically know that where he's gonna come from by just preemptively doing spin attacks to cancel him out to make the fight really really fast once we have completed the palace of twilight we are now ready to beat the game now for uh hyrule castle this is actually treated as sort of a dungeon in twilight princess but there are still a couple of skips we can do so by walking into this fight right here and then instantly skipping the cutscene, you will have movement over Link before the barrier that's supposed to lock you in right there with those enemies spawning uh, actually appear, which lets you roll out of the circle and then just immediately roll past all the enemies that are supposed to go up and fight you, which lets you then just run up to the first kind of mini boss of this dungeon. Uh, which holds the small key that gives you access to the kind of main hall of Hyrule Castle. And if you know the strats for how to kind of stun lock him, he's also an incredibly fast fight as well. You can see that by just constantly spin attacking at the perfect time and knowing when to jump slash, he's down in like 10 seconds. Uh, and then we can just save and quit and then head to the front gate. Uh, there's a couple of cool strats that we're gonna do throughout this though that does speed it up quite a lot. So for this boss, boss fight right here, there's a really cool kind of stun lock strat you can do. So he always tries to dodge your attack from behind. However, if you just do a normal slash on the front of his shield uh, without being targeted, for some reason that leaves him vulnerable behind for about half a second which can then be combined with the ball and chain to instantly take him down. So one of the longest kind of night fights in the game just becomes a 20 second fight, just like any other normal enemy. And then here, we just have to fight some enemies basically here. We're kind of just going from enemy to cutscene to cutscene. So take down these two lizards. They're going to die, open door, uh, and then let us out into the courtyard. Where they're going to find this flying dragon lizard guy, whatever you want to call him. I don't remember his name. Uh, knock him down and then stun lock him with the ball and chain. Uh, which lets you one cycle him. This will be used to run up here and pick up the small key. Uh, run over to the right side. Meet these beautiful friends that saves our lives. That we have definitely met and helped out in the speed run. Yep. We definitely know these people. Thank you by the way for the random as bazooka. In a Zelda game. Um, then we're gonna run up, pick up the big key, we run up to the main hall, and then enter the final corridors. Now here's the Gold Knight, who's one of the strongest enemies in the game. But if you stand at a very precise spot and instantly skip the cutscene, you can just barely get behind the barrier by the door before it appears which lets you skip the fight with the gold knight and then just walk up to the end of the game now nintendo always blesses speedrunners with a great fun way to end our speedruns which is 
R-N-G. That's right, we all love luck elements right at the end. They decided to make it so that Zelda right here is completely luck-based in which attack she does. She can either be nice to you and decide, yep, I want to shoot a laser ball at you to, you know, hit back at me, to damage me. Or she can decide to go for dives or building these kind of powerful laser triforce pieces on the ground. So this specific run actually got a 10 psych. You can see I've already gotten two triforces on the ground. So yeah, you can easily see yourself losing like a full up minute. Uh, but yeah, once you finally get past done that, you take her down. And we're now ready for Dark Beast Ganon. Now, Dark Beast Ganon is actually very fast if you know the strats. So, he is ba the, the, the fight is based upon two criteria. Damage and total amount of hits. So, by doing certain low damage and high damage attacks and changing out the attacks, you can actually get more attacks in on him than you're supposed to, which deals more damage than normally the player would be able to have on each fight. And you can also see you can trick him into getting like insta-hit there by standing in that corner. Um, and then after two uh, basically phases of normal Dark Beast, we're going to turn into Wolf Link. Because with the setup we just did, we dealt so much damage to Dark Beast Ganon. That when we shove him off on the right here as Wolf Link, that's it. I've seen a lot of people who have played this game, gotten up until this part, and say that this is one of the worst fights in the game. Because Zelda has terrible aim. Well, I got some bad news for you. This fight has zero RNG when it comes to Zelda. Zelda aims where you hold the analog stick. Meaning that if you miss Ganon, it is because you're not holding a proper direction on the analog stick towards Ganon. Because she will always shoot where you are holding your analog stick. So as long as you make sure to hold your analog stick in the direction of Ganon, it will always hit. Meaning you can just get three insta back to back to back shots. Now, for the final and main Ganondorf fight, this fight is terrible as a casual player, but as a speedrunner, it is one of the fastest Ganon fights in the franchise. All you gotta do is do one slash in front and then do a jump spin attack as he take up his foot to try and kick you. And time. That's it. I know, it's almost anticlimactic as of how fast it is. It's like 30 seconds. Like, that's it. That's literally it. It is just like three jump spin attacks and he's done. He's defeated. That's it. GG. Now, the current world record for Twilight Princess HD is 3 hours, 14 minutes, and 54 seconds. Now, if you're wondering why Twilight Princess and Twilight Princess HD is so long, I definitely recommend you to click on the screen right now where one video is showcased right there, which will go into the details of why speedrunners cannot break this game and all the things the developers did to avoid speedrunners from doing things like barrier skip, like other things, major sequence breaks that other games have. But that being said, thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much D3 for sending me this video and giving me permission to uh, react and break down this run. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to your channel for more awesome content, and I will see you all in the next one. Later, everybody! Bye-bye.